So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me growing up, because uh, I think there will be some similarities. I'm going to sit down because this floor is creaking under my immense weight. Um, and then hopefully in the second half you will have a myriad of questions uh, to try and stump me. Um, I grew up in Stockport. I was born in Boston, actually. Um, I am a dual citizen by accident. My mother, who is from Hyde, I, don't, I never know if there's any people who have ever been above Watford when I do things here, but <clears throat> Hyde is up north. It counts. Um, and she, but she was a doctor in, uh, at Mass General Hospital. Uh, and uh, she married my father, who is a Nigerian businessman, which sounds like an email scam starting. <laughs> um, and uh, for three years, they lived together in Boston, and then they split. And my mother came back to England with us three kids. And uh, I grew up in Stockport, which is a weird experience because Stockport in the 70s was not exactly the most um, diverse place in the world. And I was very clearly from a very early age, just the, the biggest, blackest thing <laughs> you would ever see. I was this, I was just huge. I was both obese and taller than your average bear and blacker than your average Stockfordian. And uh, I, I realized, well, it's, it's weird actually, when I was probably seven years old, I realized I, was, I had a love affair with books. Um, I loved to read. Uh, I read Asimov when I was seven. Um, I remember sitting in my uh, living room with my mum reading biology O-level books and talking about mitochondria. Uh, and I must have only had the barest concept of it, but I, even now I remember the engines of the cell from that conversation way back then which is really cool. That's the kind of mum I had. So I, when I was seven, I thought I was the smartest person in the world. And that, that kind of endured, and it was fed by my, you know, our caravan holidays to Rill, um, where it would invariably, most of my memories are of the noise of just pounding rain on the tin roof of a, of a cheap caravan. And looking around at the caravan, and I would be reading a book, my sister would be reading a book here, my other sister would be reading a book here, my mother would be reading ridiculous. She read these historical romances, so romances made up to be in Victorian times. Um, and I just, there's some tremendous comfort from seeing a whole family together, but in their own little world, it was amazing. Um, and then I, went to second, then I went to secondary school and everything changed. Um, my first day of secondary school, I walked in and uh, and I, I just, the, what I knew about myself is I was the smart kid who loved to read. And I also knew I had a burgeoning uh, love of cake and pie. Right, so it was really pie and books were my thing. And, and I walked into secondary school and um, my uniform didn't really fit. And I was wearing my granddad's trousers because we couldn't find stuff to fit me. And I walked in and people were looking at me strangely. I was the only black kid in the school at that time. Um, and then suddenly a bunch of sixth formers and a teacher approached me. I knew there were sixth formers because our uniform was, was a black blazer with gold trim designed to get you beaten up, frankly. <laughs> and the sixth formers didn't have to wear the gold trim. So these, these older boys come towards me in their black blazers and black pants and, and the teacher behind them. And they looked at me and they said, you're going to play rugby. And to me, I was in my head, I'm like, this is the antithesis of everything I stand for, right? <laughs> Physical activity, sweating, <laughs> frozen fields, mud, or, you know, steak slice and a book. This is an easy, I was like, no, 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 I'm not. And I remember the, the, the teacher, it was my physics teacher actually, ended up being, uh, who's also the rugby master, he, as he turned away, he said to these boys, he said, if he's not going to play rugby, what use is he? I was like, wow, they, they, must, not, they must not know. <laughs> right? How, good, how, how smart I am. But it was really interesting. From the age of 11, I suddenly realized I was not what I thought I was. And, and increasingly, I understood that I was 
a monster. And I, that was confirmed with me when I, when I was about, uh, I don't know, probably, probably 13 years old. And I get a book in English class. And it's one of those where they do a brief, this is your book, you've got to read it in X number of weeks, we're going to write a report afterwards, blah, blah, blah. And I look at the title, and I think this is fascinating already, and I start to open it up, I start to read, and I'm just consumed by this book. And then the teacher's like, right, put your books away, Well, you've got time to read those, uh, and now let's get back to whatever. And I had it on my lap, and I'm just reading it. The bell goes, and the next class comes, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading it. The bell goes, again, reading, and then the bell goes. I knew I was serious about this book when the bell went for lunch. And I skip lunch. And I never skip lunch. I mean, to this day, I am notorious for not missing meals. And I read the book during lunch. And it was a Wednesday afternoon. I know that because my school did all sports on Wednesday afternoons. So I went to the one place no teacher looks for a child, which is the library. And I'm in the library reading my book. And the bell goes for the end of school. I'm on the bus. And I'm reading the book. And I get home. And I'm reading the book on the, on the landing, on the stairs up to the landing upstairs. With my sisters going by me and you know, microwaving the food that my mom made on the weekend for us. And I'm just ignoring that and reading. And then finally I finish, and it's kind of dark around me, and my sisters have gone upstairs because my mom left the house before we were supposed to get up and came back after we were supposed to be in bed. And, and I, instead of going to bed immediately, I said, I need to talk to my mom about this because I've read a book that, that this book is about me. And, uh, and so I waited up. And my mother came home late as usual, and as she gets to the door, before she even gets a chance to open it fully, I'm stood in front of the door with my hand out like this, with the book in it, like I'm accusing her with it. And she looks at me and, uh, and smiles, a very weary smile. And I say to her, Mum, am I a monster with this book out in front of me? Um, and the book I've been reading all day was The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And, because in, in my experience, um, I was, clearly I didn't think I was deformed in the same way. But my experience day to day walking through Stockport and Manchester was three reactions. One of which, I mean, some of these are familiar to all of us, right? But one of which was extreme abject terror. People crossing the street. And when you're 11, 12, it's something weird about grown-ups crossing the street to avoid you. It's just it's like, really? What, what do you see? Do I have horns? And the other thing I experience, especially as a very, very tall person, along with the other attributes, is that people point and laugh a lot. And let me tell you, that can get to the, the toughest of egos. I did a, I did a TV show probably oh, about 10 years ago now, where I put body cams on me and they followed me with little tiny cameras down the streets. And in England, because in America it's slightly different. But, um, and it was just families you know, grabbing their kids and pointing and laughing. It's like, God, I'm, I mean, I wish I'd never seen that. And then the third thing that happened was that people spoke to me very slowly, as if I was fresh off the boat. And so these three things, if you read that book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, this is, you know, it's a terrifying, but also mockery-worthy, stupid creature. And my mother looks at me and she's clearly exhausted and she's like, no, you're beautiful. And I, that's the only time I've ever got away with sucking through my teeth at my mother. Uh, it's like, no, no, you're not objective. And then I storm upstairs. And I'm like, on reflection, I, I waited all that time for my mother to come home to give her that kind of drama queen uh, bit. But it's really interesting. I mean, the, the science and psychology has known about this for a long time. The, Cooley in 1902 talked about the looking glass self. Anybody familiar with? No, no. Like the looking glass self, you know it's old because it's when mirrors were called looking glasses. It's the idea that our identity is not just what we say it is, what we decide it is, but is also made up of the reflections of how people see us. And so for me, as hard as I tried to kind of resist and, and hold inside that I'm the smart kid who's reading Asimov at seven and who likes pie a little too much, the world kind of encroached on it and clad me in this thing that I must be mistaken. It's really interesting, especially because most of the people who did that were strangers or people who were inconsequential to me. So just show, I mean, it's amazing the power of people who we know objectively, we know sensibly and practically their opinions shouldn't matter. And yet somehow it does have this cumulative collage effect of Im Im impacting our identity. 
I think it's one of the things that really got me interested in, in psychology was this understanding of how other people had this impact of who I was. Um, that all changed when I was 17 and I walked down Market Street with my usual protections. And my usual protection, the only way I would go, Market Street is the main shopping street in Manchester. The only time I went down Market Street is if I was going to the Central Library. Central Library, so my usual protections meant that I'd gone to Greg's and I had about four steak slices, <laughs> like pieces of toast between my finger. And I'd been to the library, so I had a handful of books under my arm. And, uh, and I'm walking down the street and the usual stuff is happening. And I've learned at this stage already, 17 years old, to pixelate the world, just to try and ignore the pointing, the laughing, the terror, the... And I would just, you know, with everything that kind of encroached into my consciousness, I would just eat. I'm down to about two slices left to the bus stop. And this man steps up in front of me and I sigh. Because when people step up in front of me, they say stupid stuff. They say, what's the weather like up there? Which is, you know, hilarious. And they say, how big are your feet? And, and I, that's one I always really, I'm really weirded out about because... When, when has it ever been appropriate to ask strangers about the size of their body parts? It's really weird. But people do that all the time. And then have running commentaries about it. But instead, this man stood in front of me. And he didn't say, would you like to play basketball? To which I would have said, I have two steak slices left and six books to read. Get out of my way. He didn't even say, you should play basketball. This is something I hate. This is what we do to kids all the time in education and, and people in workplaces too. You, you should do this. And what we really mean is what you're good for is. That's what people mean when they tell me, oh, you should be a basketball player. When I walk down the streets here in London and somebody says, oh, you should be a basketball player. What they really mean is all I can possibly conceive that you could add any value to this world in is that. So much so, to digress slightly, I was on a plane the other day, not this flight I've just taken, but I was on a plane to Boston because I go back there pretty regularly. And um, when I got on, the flight attendant was like, you must be a basketball player. That's the should thing again. And I was like, no, I'm a psychologist. Because who talks about what they did 10 years ago, right? <laughs> People who have not done anything interesting recently. No, I'm a psychologist. And she looked at me in this lovely way and then patted me on the shoulder like, yeah. And then walked off. Then she came back once we hit 10,000 feet with her colleague who said, um, we decided you played for the Celtics. And I'm like... No offense, but I mean, I'm not trying to denigrate myself, but this, this is, this is not the body of a basketball player. I mean, clearly. I said, no, I'm a psychologist. And he said, well, uh, come on now, what do you really do? And that's when it gets really weird. It's like, I don't know where to go with this and still be polite. Because I don't know what nexus of unconscious or semi-conscious bias and slight racism you have going on here that allows you to, to go deeper into this. But if I was going to make up a job that I was going to do, why the hell would I make up psychologists? Anyway, so it, it happens all the time. I forgot where I was in my other story, so now we have to move on. The guy stood in front of Ah, there we go. Good. It's a pivotal moment. Thank you for paying attention. Um, so he stood in front of me and he says, you would be great at basketball. And I nearly dropped my steak slices. And not because of the basketball thing, because let's face it, in the 70s, uh, sorry, in the 80s, in England, nobody knew what basketball was. But I was here, and I'm like, I'm looking around, I'm not in my house, and someone's just said I'll be great at something. And so I was like, go on. <laughs> Tell me more about my future greatness. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, here's a number, here's, a, here's an address. You go to this place on Tuesday night, and, and, uh, and they'll start you off. And I don't really do strangers if I can help it. I'm an extreme introvert in my personality type. I find human interaction exhausting, which is an interesting juxtaposition with being a psychologist, I know, but there you have it. So the idea of going somewhere to meet strangers who were sporty seemed like a crazy thing, but I, I, what have I got to lose? And the guy said, great. So I go to this, this place and I... Uh, stand outside a, a, a horrible community center gym in Cholton and it's just absolutely teeming down with rain and I'm wearing my rugby kit, standard school issue, with plimsolls for those of you of a certain age who <laughs> remember those. 
and, um, and I'm just getting soaked. And I can hear stuff going on inside, basketballs bouncing, people laughing and shouting, and the shoes squeaking on the floor, uh, getting very cold. And so I say, I'll go in. And the, the, the door, you won't know this, but all doors are small doors. But this was a particularly small door. And I felt like I was obviously to kind of crawl underneath to get inside. And, um, and as I, I arrived inside, everything stopped. It was quite literally like what happens when the, the good guys enter the bad guy bar and everything stops. There's just one basketball bounce, 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 bounce. <laughs> and then they start running towards me. And normally in my experience, when people ran towards me in Stockport and Manchester, it wasn't a good thing that was going to happen. And so I'm backing towards the door and then they grab me by the arms and I'm like, this cannot be good. And then they're yelling, he's on our team. And I tell you, in that moment, I cared not a jot about basketball, but my heart nearly exploded. I was like, I'm on their team. And all of a sudden, in front of me were 15, 18, I don't know how many in total, but 15, 18 faces. And when I looked in their faces, reflected back at me was something new. Not the same as what my mom and my family reflected back, but something new that spoke of depths of potential. I was like, this is intoxicating. I, I am never leaving this space. We played. I scored my first basket, my only basket that day. <laughs> and at the end, we're sitting down and we're taking our shoes off. And, uh, and they're talking about the NBA. I was like, what's this NBA? And they're like, oh, that's only where all the best people in the world play. It's like, and in my head, this is the calculation, right? This is awesome. This horrible gym with a horrible floor that leaks in the corner with these people who I've never met. This is awesome. The best people in the world doing this, this must feel like this times a thousand. So I said to my friend Chris King, still my friend to this day, Chris King had been talking about the NBA. I said, yeah, 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 I'll have some of that. I'll do that. And the three people who were tying their shoelaces with me kind of looked at me and was like, yeah, good idea incredibly ridiculous, stupid, naive. And yet that was the day I decided I'd play in the NBA. And it happened. I've got two minutes left in this session, in this first part. Um, I don't know what else you want to hear. The best piece of advice, maybe I'm do that and then there's the break and then you've got questions. Because the best piece of advice is related to this. I go back and tell my mother after having, I told, I was going to be a psychologist. I knew I'd be a psychologist at seven years old. It's a long story, but I always knew that's what I'd do. Um, and I went back to my mum and had to break it to her that I wasn't going to go to Leeds to study psychology or anywhere local. And that, in fact, I was going to go to America and play in the NBA. I broke this to her while she's listening to The Arches <laughs> on Radio 4, trying to relax, eyes closed late at night. And, and she kind of deep sighs in a way that's trying not to sigh, but it is clearly a sigh. And, uh, and I explained to her how I was going to go to her. She said, how are you going to get to America? I said, well, and the first thing I did, I remember very well, I was stood, in the, stood at the windowsill, so I was just like lit by the, the amber street lights. There's no, all the lights are off in the room. She's listening to the arches, and I'm here trying to be dramatic. It's what I do. And... Um, she says, how are you going to get to America? And the first thing I did to her was this. I was like, <laughs> right? This. Because I think I was convinced, because I'd never seen anybody else my size. I thought we were like unicorns. I, I thought that was like one in a country. Um, and so it would be easy. And then she let me explain how I'm going to go to America, get a scholarship, because that's easy to do. Um, we'd have to scrape together the money to get me to America, which was inconceivable in itself. And... And then I would get drafted to the NBA. And then I did I mention at the end of this little kind of rant, and then I'll buy you a house <laughs> to sweeten the pot a little bit. And then she said, uh, would you recognize your soul in the dark? And I said what any self-respecting 17-year-old would say, which is, what the hell are you talking about? What does that even mean? I'm telling you deep stuff, and you're trying to, What? And then my mother was, you know, very secular. It, was nothing, it wasn't really a, a God comment for her. This was about, she said, most people who, who want to do ordinary things, 
or the, the well-trodden path, they, they don't need to know much about who they are. They can just forge into the future. But if you want to do something that no one has ever done, literally no one has ever done before, then you, you have to know who you are. All the resources, all the good things that can help you, all the bad things that might trip you up. The best piece of advice I've ever had. It's an exercise I use with clients today to help them when they're starting interesting new journeys and transitions. And it's certainly the piece of advice that has armored me most for every transition I've made since then. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and watch the rest of our talks below.